the ministry of refreshing others. The ministry. We're talking about a ministry for every believer. If you're sitting here this morning and the devil's been playing a trick on your mind that you have no use of the kingdom of God and you've not accomplished anything or have no ministry, you do. In fact, it's according to the scripture and what I'll prove to you this morning is that this is the last day outpouring, that there's going to be a one-on-one -on -one ministry in the last days, that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to come simply through... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, great evangelist or television is going to come in a very quiet way but widespread throughout the whole world. Heavenly Father, give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. I need your touch and I need your anointing because I can't preach without it. We have nothing to say without the Holy Spirit and we have to have ears to hear what the Spirit says. Lord, you've given me this message for this congregation at this particular time, and we receive it from you. In Christ's name I pray. <clears throat> Amen. Would you go to 2 Corinthians, please, to the 7th chapter? And I'm going to read to you just a few verses. 2 Corinthians, 7th chapter. And let's begin at verse 5. This is Paul speaking. For when we were come into Macedonia... Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted or refreshed us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. <clears throat> We're going to stop right there, and let me give you the context of what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, my flesh, he, when he says us, he's speaking of himself. My flesh had no rest, but I was troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears. <clears throat> now, if you look this way, let me give you the background of Paul's statement. Paul is not a God-man. He's a human, just like you and I. And if Paul the Apostle didn't go through problems, if he didn't suffer the same distresses that I suffer, if he's not tribulated as I am tribulated, then he has nothing to say to me or to the church. If Paul the Apostle does not go through down times, if he is not under stress, if he does not uh, experience the whole uh, area of difficulties that we as Christians face, then his epistles are written in vain. But Paul was an ordinary man, a godly man, but he was flesh and blood. And he's going through the most difficult time in his life. In, in the context of this, Paul had written a letter to the Corinthian church, a letter of correction. There, there was a very... A difficult moral situation in the church at Corinth. Now, Paul loved the church at Corinth. This was born in his heart. This was his child, so to speak, and he loved the Corinthian church with all of its problems. He loved it, but he saw a situation and heard of a situation that was not being dealt with. <clears throat> it was a moral situation, a, a very serious moral condition, and Paul the apostle waited for somebody to deal with a situation it wasn't dealt with. So Paul wrote a stinging, hard letter to the church at Corinth, at Corinth. In fact, he said to the elders and to the people, you have been puffed up. You're not mourning over this open sin. You have not judged righteous judgment. You have, put, you have not put the perpetrator out of fellowship until you've seen, and you have not seen a true repentance because he said the man who did this has not repented and you have not dealt with it. you are overlooking it and then these hard hard words Paul said you must in the name of the Lord and in essence this is what he's saying you must deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord <clears throat> now even Paul later said at first I regretted sending that letter <clears throat> he 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 knew it was a hard letter, but he said he wrote it in tears and fear. He said, and it's because he loved the church. He could see where it was going. 
And the church, there had crept into the church at Corinth uh, false prophets that were despising his suffering. They literally said, if, in essence of what they were saying, if Paul the apostle was a man of God, if he's a praying man, if he truly knows God intimately, if he knows this Christ intimately, he would not be suffering like he's suffering. And why all the reproach would he bring on this church, all this being jailed and beaten? If he had faith, he would not be suffering. You still hear that accusation today among some of the most righteous people that suffer. And people look at those who suffer and say, there must be something wrong. There must be some kind of sin. There must be some reason there is so much suffering in this life. I, I, I knew a preacher. He, he had suffered so much for so many years. that I, 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 And one day, I was standing before him. I thought, what has this man done that he suffered like this? And the Spirit rebuked me and said, he's probably the holiest man you've ever met. And, and uh, if you just <clears throat> wait a little while, you'll understand what's <laughs> what he's going through. And it took me many years, but I found out. <clears throat> but Paul was so concerned about this letter that it would trouble the church at Corinth. In fact, he, he was to go, but he didn't go. Later, he told me, he said, I didn't come because I didn't want to come in weariness. My flesh was so weary. And this was why he was weary. Have I hurt God's people? Have I wounded the people of God? Years ago, when this church was in the first few years of its inception, I was on this stage, and I preached what I had felt was a hard message. Some of you may have been in that meeting. And I remember at this spot right here being stricken and fall on my face because the scripture came to me uh, do not reprove the righteous and do not bless or encourage the wicked and I was weeping and said God did I cross the line did I wound his congregation now every one of these pastors when they're called to prophesy or preach what would be called a hard message or a difficult message because it really goes deep into our hearts it wounds the man. I, I've left this pulpit many times wounded. I've gone home to the apartment and I sat there and told Gwen, I'll never preach like that again. I can't handle this. It just tears my guts up. I've heard it from Pastor Card. I know Pastor Neil. Every one of these pastors have felt that. You go through that. And, and yet that night, for 45 minutes, I laid here and I thought everybody was gone. Nobody left. Some people said they thought they heard angels singing that night. And God, God dealt with me, and I know what Paul the Apostle was going through. Did I wound the church? And he said, for a season, I did repent. But then I didn't repent after I found out the impact of my message. But rather than go to Macedonia, he sends Titus. And he said, Titus, I want you to go, and I want you to tell the people I love them. Explain this message was, was sent in tears because I love the church and I love you, the people tell them I mean them no harm but this has to be dealt with just tell them I love them and find out the impact of my letter because I can't handle this anymore I am grieved over it and he said and I'm going to go to Troas he was going to Ephesus he said, I'm going to go to Troas and after a short time and they must have had an agreement I want to meet you in Troas and you tell me what the impact of my letter was Paul goes to Ephesus, and at Ephesus, God pours out his spirit. And they're worshiping the god Diana. <clears throat> and the spirit of God comes down, and the people are bringing their, their occult books about Diana, and even their silver gods that the silversmiths have been passing out and selling and making a living on. And God moves, and the, the whole city is stirred, the Bible says. But they rose up all the merchants and silversmiths, and a riot ensued. Uh, uh, the whole city was in a riot and went into an amphitheater. And Paul the Apostle wanted to go in. He wanted so bad to go in and preach to that mad crowd. That was Paul's nature. But his friends said no. In fact, he was forbidden by his close friends to go in. And the Bible, the Bible says that 
he even despaired of his life. Later he said, we, there was such trouble and, and I was so cast down, I even despaired of life. And I think it's the time in Ephesus that he escaped for his life because of the mob. And so he leaves. Something happened in Ephesus. We don't have the whole story. I've, I've looked through all my commentaries and, and, and not Calvin, not John Calvin, not any of the theologians and uh, could find anything where it could describe what he says in, in first chapter, second Corinthians. Uh, I was cast down, but not in despair. And, and you know it, he's, the, the condition that Paul was in. He was weary. He was tired. He was a broken, wounded soldier of the cross. And he said, I want you to know the trouble that we had. He said, on, on every side. But there's something in his heart that he, he's very anxious. He's on his way to Troas. I'm going to see my son in the Lord Titus. And I'm going to find out what happens. And the Bible says that when he gets to, to Troas... By the way, he said he was pressed out of measure, above strength, and so much that he despaired even of life, persecuted, perplexed, and cast down. Now, he has the, per, the burden of this letter to Corinth that's troubling him, weary in spirit. And he goes now to Troas, and he, 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 he needs somebody to talk to. He, he is so down. Paul the Apostle never had been down any more than this. And he said, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened to me of the Lord. But I had no rest in my spirit because I didn't find Titus my brother. But taking leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Now here's what the Bible says, I just read it to you. He said, when I got to Troas, God just opened up the doors for ministry. Amazing. And Paul did something he'd never done in his life. Something contrary to everything he preached. He said, but I went on. I, just, I walked away. Later he explained his weariness of spirit. I didn't want to minister in spirit. He didn't feel like preaching. He didn't feel like ministering. Paul the apostle is hurt. He's a wounded man. He said... We came to preach Christ's gospel. I had no rest in my spirit. Why? Because I found not Titus, my brother. But he had a secondary plan. The secondary plan was to meet him. If you can't meet him and trust, meet him in Macedonia. He goes to Macedonia, the most wounded condition in, in his ministry. Titus is not waiting. Titus is not there. And this is when Paul reaches this low point that was my text. For when we were come into Macedonia, chapter 7, verse 5, it says, when I got to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side with outward fightings and in with fears. You see, when, when the enemy can bring unrest when the enemy comes to attack godly men and women. He comes first with this weariness, this tiredness of the battle. And then he begins to lie. I can only imagine, I can only try to conceive, and, and, and most theologians have speculated on this, but knowing human nature having lived for 74 years now and preached for 50 years, some things I've learned by observing others and by what I've learned in my own life. When Paul is down now, Titus is not there, and I know what the enemy is about to do. He's going to tell Paul, even Titus has turned against you. See, see Paul said, all Asia has turned against me. And, and that's not so because he was loved, and I could name you ten different sons of his in the scripture and others that were just praying for him. But in his mind, everybody has left me. I'm forsaken. I'm on my own. And 
Titus does not show up in what the devil is saying. And there are two things, there are two lies that the devil will tell you when you are down. You have been rejected and you're not effective. You've lost your effectiveness and everyone is against you. And God must have a controversy with you. And the lie that was coming to, to Paul the Apostle, this great man of God, right out of hell, just as it came toward Christ himself. Paul, Titus got caught up in the gossip in Corinth. Your letter was so hard, even Titus couldn't handle it. And now he's been sucked in, he's been brought in by these false teachers. Titus has turned against you. And you can feel so alone, and you can feel like no one, there's no one to go to. And, and Paul needed somebody. He, he walked in the Holy Ghost, but he just needed a voice. He needed a, a, a somewhere, somehow, to be comforted. He was down. I, I've seen pastors, I've seen Christians so down. I, I looked at some and said, how, how can they ever get up? What kind of words? What can you give me, Lord, in the pulpit or in, in some way? How can I reach that person? How will they ever get out of that pit of this depression? That fear that something has gripped their heart. How, how are they ever going to get out? And some of you here listening to me now, you're in some kind of pit. You're in something. And folks, sometimes God will deliver a message if there are only five or six people in the whole house out of thousands that need to hear it. And if you don't need this now, as I've said many times in this pulpit, keep notes or get a copy of the tape. You will need it someday. <laughs> Titus, he's thinking now, Titus has been caught up in this. I have wounded people that Paul's thinking, I am not affected, I've been rejected. Paul speaks because you find Paul defending his call time after time, defending his chains, always having to stand up before the church and defend and defend and defend. But this time Paul can't defend himself. And this time Paul is absolutely weary. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? Is this just about a Bible character, Paul the Apostle, great man as he is? Well, I'll tell you what blesses me. He's such a great man. He's such a man of the word. He's so humble and so broken. If he hurts, then I'm sure going to hurt. Because I don't come anywhere near, none of us come near the walk that this man had with of intimacy with Christ. Nevertheless, Paul says... God that comforted those that are cast down. In the word there, one of the Greek words is refreshment. The God of all refreshment. Who, who refreshes. But we were come to Mass and our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side within. We're fighting and... Without we're fighting in with their fears. There's fear. He said, I was full of fear and I had all of these lies flying around me. The devil's a liar, folks. And he'd been lying to some of you. He's lying to you that you've been rejected, that you have no place in the kingdom of God, you have no ministry, you're just sitting here taking up space. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. And until you get the victory over that, you can never get out. Nevertheless, God that comforts or refreshes those that are cast down. Now, how does the Holy Ghost comfort people? We, we talk about the Holy Ghost being a comforter. Uh, he doesn't send angels. Yes, he's a spirit and he abides here, but how does he comfort us? Paul the Apostle is in a pit. How did the Holy Ghost comfort him? God that comforted all that cast down comforted me. By the coming of Titus. Titus shows up. Oh, I wish God could have just torn the curtain back when Paul was down and cast down. 
fears within and fightings without. I wish the Lord could have showed him what was happening at Corinth while the devil's lying to him, tell him all these lies. A revival broke out because of that letter down in Corinth. People are repenting. They deal with this man. He repents and stands before the church and said, I was wrong. Paul the apostle is right. And they were saying to Titus, quick, get to Paul and tell him we love him. And he doesn't know any of this. Folks, if you could just have the curtain pulled back just a little bit and God could give you and I a peek into what he's doing. He said, my thoughts toward you are holy. They are pure. They are good thoughts. While the devil telling you it's all over and lying to you, the Holy Ghost is at work. He, if he could call the curtain back, it all lies. And God is blessing while the devil lying to you. Glory to God. He said, we, I was comforted by a company not only of Titus, but uh, not his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. He said, I, I, what comforted me was he was so refreshed by you. He, he goes down. T Titus goes to Corinth. He loves his spiritual father, Paul, and he's burdened down, and he, he goes, he's, he's afraid of what he's going to hear. He's afraid he's going to have to take this message back to, Ty, back to Paul because he's such a, he so loves this man, and he is so refreshed by what he sees. He's so revived. Can you imagine when Paul and Titus meet? Paul is downcast, and, and he, he's sitting there. I'm sure he's praying, and in walks Titus. Brother Paul. I can't wait to tell you, you'll never believe what's happened. And Paul's thinking, oh no, I don't want to hear this. And he puts his arms around his spiritual father. He said, Paul, I am so happy in Jesus. And Paul's thinking, good for you. But there's a smile. He's refreshed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him because of what he's seen and heard of in Corinth and he said Paul first of all they send me their love everyone all the elders they're dealing with the false prophets no one's despising your chain anymore no one's despising your suffering anymore now they know they have gone through some of that themselves and Paul you have been used by the Holy Ghost to shake all of Corinth Paul Later writing about that moment, he said, I was so filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all my tribulation. He said, I still got problems, but now something's going on in me. I have been refreshed. Who refreshed him? No angel. He was a man who had been refreshed in his own spirit. God refreshes those who are cast down by other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who have been refreshed by the Holy Ghost. I'm filled with refreshment. I'm exceeding joyful in all my tribulations. You can find this all through scriptures. In Acts, the... 27th chapter, don't turn there, but he's on his way to Rome, and the ship stops in, in, at Sidon, and Paul asks permission to go to visit some believers on this island, and here's what it says, and Julius, captain, gave him liberty to go to his friends to refresh himself, to refresh himself. You find it all through Scripture. In 2 Timothy 1.16, the Lord give mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently and found me, and in many ways he ministered to me. This is one of his spiritual sons and. He, he said, I, I needed refreshment. In fact, Paul was imprisoned at the time, house in prison. And he, he said, he sought me out. He went all through the city asking questions, and he found me. In other words, this ministry of refreshment is seeking out those who hurt, 
Onesimus said he's in trouble, he's in pain, he needs help, he needs somebody just to tell him God is with him. Tell him that he is needed in the house of God, he's needed in the work of God. And Paul the Apostle said, so often this man refreshed me. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. We are not islands in ourselves where we get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues and sit there in front of a mirror, enjoy it, and say, thank you, God, for filling me with your spirit and giving me power. He didn't give you power to look in the mirror. He didn't give us power just to raise our hands. He gave us power to refresh. He's a refreshing spirit. He is giving us power to refresh any other brother and sister in Christ. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. We talk about the power of the Holy Ghost, and we want to see people fall. We want to see people jump. We want to see all these things. Thank God for manifestations if they're genuine. But folks, the power of the Holy Ghost is a, he's a comforter, and he's a refresher. And if we're filled with the Holy Ghost, then he said there's going to be a well of living water. There's going to be cool water, refreshing, coming out of your mouth. But like Onesiphorus, you're going to search it out. You're going to get up in the morning and say, God, lead me to somebody. You're going to hear about somebody in the church that's in need and suffering and try to get a telephone number. And no gossip. No talking about anybody else in the church. But just going up and say, brother, I want to pray for you. I've got a good word for you. I've, if you're going to give words to people, make sure they're good words. Make sure they're refreshing words. I was refreshed by the coming of Titus. You find it in the Old Testament as well. David's in the wilderness, and, and he's been chased by Saul day after day, and he's weary, and he's tired, and he... He's confused. He's been told that he's going to be king. And this didn't look like kingship to David. He's hiding in caves and he's weary. And he's really about to leave the country. But God who comforts those who are downcast, Paul says, God moves on Jonathan, his dearest friend. The Bible says, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose up, and he went to David into the woods. And Jonathan strengthened David's hand in God and said to him, David, don't be afraid. My father will never find you. You're yet going to be king of Israel, and I'm going to be sitting next to you. Think of what there was for David. It was not an angel coming down. It was no theophany. It, it, it was a man, a friend. He said, I've got to get to David. David is in need, and God sends this man. Folks, there are people that need you. They need to hear your voice. They, it, it should be that every time you come into this church, there should be a prayer that you are breathing, Lord, lead me to somebody today. We just need a hug and a word of encouragement and say, brother, I just, I just feel that God wants you to know that he's with you. And that's what Jonathan told David. Jonathan said, David, you may not feel like it. It may not look like it, but God is with you. He's not left you. You're right in the center of God's will. And what he promised you is going to come to pass. He was told that not by an angel, but by another human being. Refreshed by a refreshed man. I could go on and on through this, but he strengthened David's hand in the Lord. <clears throat> Should we go on? Sometimes I have a tendency to <clears throat> make it short. Lately, the older I get, Paul teaches us there's a, there's a glorious purpose in all of our sufferings and our tribulations. And if you don't understand the reason for your suffering, if you don't understand why God's taking you through what you're going through now, you can spin out. 
You can spin out into bitterness. You can spin out into a, a depression that no one can touch you and pull you out. If you don't understand it, and let, let me tell you, this has, to be, this has to be understood by every believer that is being tested and going through what Paul the Apostle went through. And what Paul came out of this in the second letter to, to, to another letter to the Corinthians, he said, let me tell you something now. Many have despised my sufferings. They can't understand it. But he said, I'm going to tell you the real reason for it. He said, it's not about me, it's about you. He said, I'm suffering because of what God wants to do in you. He said, he's going to let me be an example. He's going to let me go through things. Paul's looking out over a mass of people, over a church that he loves, and he, he sees in the spirit all these trials and suffering. He sees the persecutions that are coming. He said, so God's, I'm a pattern man. He, he said, I'm going through all of this so that the Holy Spirit can comfort me. He's going to teach me the spirit of comfort. He's going to talk, teach me the ways of comfort so that I can come to you and I can comfort you and you'll know that my words have power because you know I've been through it. I didn't just write you a book. I didn't just send you a note having not experienced it. You know what I've been through and because you know what I've been through and you've seen how God has come and comforted me, he's consoled me for your sake. Here's how he put it. For whether I be afflicted it's for your refreshing, for your salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we all suffer. It's for the consolation and salvation of the body, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort or refresh them that are also in trouble by the comfort by which we've been comforted. In other words, the very way that I've been refreshed, the ways and means that God came to me and pulled me out. Now I can go. I can go to any brother. I can go to any sister. And I'll say, and, and say, I have a word. I have something from God. And make sure that you pray. Folks, if, if the Holy Ghost abides in you, and God puts you next to somebody that's suffering or in pain and needs a word from you. You don't have to get down to your knees and say, oh God, please, quick, 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 give me a word. He abides here. He'll speak to you. He'll speak to you. He'll put words in your mouth. He told his servants, you don't even have to worry when you get up before uh, kings and princes because you don't have to study about it. I'll put words in your mouth. And if you have a heart like Onesiphorus that you just want to be a refresher, that is the ministry, and you're going through it, it's for the sake of somebody, for the sake of your family, if, if you're a teacher, your students, whoever it may be, God is taking you through this for a reason. God doesn't get any pleasure out of seeing any of us suffer. No, no, no. He, 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 God would so want to jump in immediately to show you where it's going. He wants to show you the, the future and the glory and the blessing and the honor to his name that you're going to bring. He can't do it. Otherwise, he, otherwise, you would not endure the suffering and you would not need the consolation. You need the consolation so that you can give consolation. Is that simple enough? Now, before I close, I, I want to show you from Micah. Uh, I, I'm rather Malachi. Uh, uh, please go with me to the third chapter of Malachi, the last chapter in the Old Testament. I want to prove to you that this ministry of refreshment by the body of Christ is going to be the last day outpouring of the Holy Spirit and is, in fact, happening right now. Malachi, the third chapter. <clears throat> Begin with me with the 16th verse. <clears throat> then they that feared the Lord... What? Spake, the King James says, spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Now look this way if you will please. It says then. This, that's when the ministry begins, then. When? What, what is the context? If you read that, 
you, you'll find that he's talking about a time that is coming when the devourer has devoured so much fruit. Words have been spoken stout against the Lord. People have said it's vain to serve God. What profit is there in it? And we keep his ordinance that we've walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the proud happy. Yea, that work wickedness are set up. Yea, that tempt God or even deliver it. And what, what the prophet Malachi is saying, and he's speaking now, that this is not only to Israel, he's speaking now to the church to come. He said there's going to come a time of weariness when people look around and they, they see people in compromise being prospered. They see people that are not living. See, he's talking about those who are people of God. He's talking in this whole book, of, he's addressing the people of God. He said some, some live lives that are not worthy of the Lord and they prosper. And then those who have labored so hard there's going to be a temptation coming to say why should we struggle so hard look look at all these people into prosperity look look at all these people and they're being blessed and i'm serving i'm fasting i'm praying and i'm suffering i'm going through all of this and you read the third chapter and you read the book of malachi and you see that this this is a mirror of our present day everything we're going through now is here in this book and this is how the Old Testament closes, and he's about to introduce the New Covenant and the New Testament, the way God's going to work in the last days. And in the last of the last days, I believe this is how God is going to do something marvelous and glorious in his church. Then, after all of this, all of this talk of it being vain, it doesn't pay to suffer, it doesn't pay to go through these hard times, it doesn't pay, why, why just back off, take it easy, don't, don't work at it so hard. All this fasting and all this praying and all this seeking of God and all of this, this, this uh, difficult walk. Then they that feared the Lord spake one to another. They are refreshing one another. And God is so pleased with this ministry. He is so pleased that God's people are speaking now one to another. And they are not, as I said, gossiping. They are not talking against pastors. They're not talking about others in the church. They're not into any racial bigotry. They're, folks, God forbid these things be in this or any church that calls itself by the name of Jesus Christ. No, no, no. It should be that every one of us, we begin to lay hold of this. And you sit in this meeting today. This is your ministry. This is your calling, and it's my calling. And the Bible says God's going to has a book of remembrance, a special book of remembrance. This is not the book that we've been reading about Revelation. This is another book, uh, just a book of remembrance of all of these individuals who are speaking one to another, and every word of encouragement, every bit of refreshment is being recorded. And the Lord said, when I count up my jewels, I'm going to read that book. I'm going to name them out of this book. These are my jewels. He's not talking about name evangelists. He's not talking about those that are, are popular. He's talking about individuals. They, they, they spake one to another. It's a one-on-one -on -one ministry. It's my ministry. It's your ministry. And now more than more, I thank God for the numbers of pastors that come. And I thank God for preaching to the great numbers here in Times Square Church, wherever. But folks, I'm seeing more and more that the most glorious thing now is to be able to pick up a telephone and call somebody. I got a letter. Let me give you an example. I got a letter this past week from a former nun who is now an ordained minister. And she's 59 years old. And she had a stroke recently and fell into a deep depression. So she's planning her funeral. And she wrote her own obituary. And she wanted to share it with me. Here's, here's, here's her obituary. No one's wife, no one's mother, estranged from my family because of my salvation. 
accomplished nothing of importance in my life, lived in poverty, a real loser has died. That was her obituary, but she said, but Brother David, I'm going to tell you something. I have been so refreshed. Someone handed me a letter, you preach at Times Square Church, I've labored in vain. And she said, that was everything I was going through. God sent a man with the word, a pastor gave her the letter. You see, God uses people. God bring us down from these visions of big dreams and these visions of having somebody prophesy over you're going to win thousands, you're going to go to China, you're going to go to India. Forget it. Most of you are not going to India, you're not going to China, but you have the power of the Holy Ghost to go to somebody in this church or somewhere else that's hurting and you can bring refreshment. Let's stand and give... Let's refresh the Holy Spirit. Let's just refresh the Lord with our love. Raise your hands and love Jesus right now with me. In the annex, wherever you are. Come on, lift up your hands and say, Jesus, make me a refresher of men. Holy Ghost, lead me and guide me into a ministry of refreshment before you. Glory be to God forever. Well, I feel like preaching again. But I'm not. I'll, I'll do that next Sunday. <laughs> now, as I prayed about this service and how it should be closed, this is what I felt I heard from the Holy Spirit. That there were going to be those in the service this morning, in the annex and here in the main floor, maybe elsewhere behind me. But some of you that, <clears throat> and of course, uh, majority of it could say I'm being tested and being tried. I'm not talking about to being tested and tried. I'm talking about those that came this morning and you are uh, totally, absolutely in need of refreshment. Now this morning, I'm your Titus. I'm not boasting, that's on the word of God. If God uses man, I'm a man and I love the body of Christ and I'm standing here, I'm your Titus. I brought you good news. I told you God loves you. I told you God's with you. I told you everything that was told Paul the Apostle. Now I want to embrace you in prayer. But please don't come unless it's a crisis where you say, Pastor, I'm in a crisis, a real crisis. If it's marriage, I don't know what it may be, but it's in a crisis. It, it is. You're in that situation where all around is trouble and inside is all fear. And you're at that place now. Now open your heart and examine yourself. And the Lord knows just who you are. And he will refresh you. He, he will lift your spirit. You, you're not going to, I'm not going to pass out Prozac. I'm going to give you Holy Ghost, something better than that through the Holy Spirit. I invite you to step out of your seat and up in the balcony. Come and stand here in the front. Please don't come unless this is what I'm really talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Pastor David, I, I've, I've been to altar calls many times, but this has to be something that's very, very critical in your life. Upstairs there, and in, in the annex, uh, <clears throat> just move ahead and stand between the screens. I don't think we'd have room down here, but just go and stand between the screens. You can hear me, and I'll pray for you there, but I, I want to be your Titus, and I want to encourage and pray for you this morning, and the body will join me. Just step out from wherever you're at. I'm not going to preach my sermon over. I just want to say this. How is it that Paul received the message of Titus? Because he knew the man. Yes. He knew he wouldn't lie. He knew he could trust the words of this man. You see, this is where our trust is founded here. But you have to believe what it says. And here's, I just want to give this to you. Lord, just lay this on, on my heart from the 140th Psalm, David's in a real battle. He's in another 
huge struggle in his life. In fact, he said, he prayed, God deliver me from the evil man, preserve me from violent man. He's talking about the devil himself. He said, my enemies imagine mischiefs in their heart. <clears throat> Continually they gather together for war against me. Continually these demon powers, these lying spirits gather together. And David said, they've sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Poison is under their lips. And he says, keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violence who have proposed to overthrow my goings. You see, the enemy's set to overthrow you, overthrow your faith, destroy you. And David said, the proud have laid a snare for me. They've spread a net for my way. They've set traps for me. And that's what the devil has done. He tries to trap you and get you down in a pit of despair. And so you can't come out. But a word came to David, just a simple word. Oh God, strengthen my salvation. You have covered my head in the day of the battle. You've covered my head. David's, and you see, he's talking about his mind. You have covered my mind. All these lies that come against me, all these fears that are coming against me. But David looks up, he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, you have covered my mind. You've covered, and I'm going to ask the Lord to just cover your mind right now. Will, will you believe God with me right now? First of all, if you've sinned against the Lord, if you're not walking with Christ, if you, if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, ask him right now. Repent of your sin first. Say, Lord, forgive me. I repent of my sins. I don't think you can get saved just saying, I believe on Jesus Christ. I, that doesn't save you. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You repent in your heart. And let, let there be godly sorrow arise by the Spirit of the Lord. And then you have every right to pray with us now. Look this way, please. I bring you a Titus word right now. And hear it in the spirit, in your struggle, in your pain. He feels it. He knows it. And he's going to go with you through the battle. And you're not going down by a lie. I don't care if it's a husband that's hurting you, a wife that's hurting you in a troubled marriage. Those things that are thrown against you. Would you just learn to say this? The Lord has covered my head in the battle. The Lord has covered my head in the battle. Now let me pray for you. Father, I pray for a miracle now that you would come by your spirit and do what I cannot do, what no human being can do and can be done only by and through the Holy Spirit. And that is to refresh our minds, our bodies, our spirits. Right now, Holy Spirit, come. And I, I pray, Lord, that every lie of the devil be exposed for what it is, just a lie. And Lord, let us know that the suffering and the pain and that which we go through is just for a season. And the Bible said these things will pass away. He said tears may happen through the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. Joy will come. Joy will follow. Would you lift up your hands in the annex and here, those that have come for prayer, will you pray this prayer with me, please? Lord Jesus, I believe this. You have covered my head. Protect me from the lies of the enemy. Let nothing destroy me. Put a wall of fire round about me. And I will trust you. I thank you, Lord, that you have refreshed me. Now touch me and give me a ministry of refreshing others. Lead me to those who need it. And let that be the joy of my life. All right, now look at me, please. When you wake up tomorrow morning, the first thing you do when you get out of bed, pray this prayer. And I'm doing it now. Lord, lead me to somebody. Show me somebody. Bring somebody into my path, and you'll know the Spirit will quicken. There'll just be something leaping in your heart. And so what, what you need to do, remember, don't just go quoting scriptures to people. Sometimes people, 
need more than just the scripture. Sometimes when a man is three, I, I know he needs two dollars more than he needs the scripture. And I give it scripture too, but I make sure that there's an act of love. This is about loving the body of Jesus Christ first and then reaching out to the whole world. And if every one of us have this ministry, what a time it's going to be in the house of God when we come all refreshed in the spirit and have that refreshing. Let's leave. Uh, would you, just one last thing. Uh, this is a praying church. We have just prayed for Pastor Carter and Teresa and Sister Teresa and all the team from the church down in Argentina. And God is going to break through. There's, there's no question. Nothing's going to stop or hinder that. I, I ask you to join me in prayer for Belarus. It's in the newspapers today. It was there two years ago. This in Minsk, the capital of Belarus. This is one of the last communist strongholds. It's ruled by a, a, a vicious dictator. And there's a statue of Lenin right in Minsk Square. And I stood there and the Holy Spirit told me to prophesy in the service that night that that Lenin statue was coming down. We came and they had this church begin to pray. Now it's been two years. They've not been able to build churches. There's very little, if any, religious freedom. But I, I so believed it was of the Lord. I, we sent, there were five denominations cooperating in our meeting, and I, we sent seed faith. We sent thousands of dollars to each group, seed faith, for the time that that statue comes down, and they were able to build churches. There's a seed money to build new churches. Well, some of the pastors, I, I got word this past uh, week, some pastors were very discouraged that Pastor David prophesied this is coming down and it hasn't happened. Instead, we were suffering more than we've ever suffered. And I know the devil would like to come and lie to me. Well, you're a false prophet. But I want to tell you something. I didn't say when it was happened, but if you read your paper today, there are 250 students now camped out in that same court or near that statue. And the statue is just a symbol of the communist stronghold, this dictator. And I want you to pray that crowds will gather just as they did in Ukraine and brought down the communist regime there. That God will bring down the communist regime and bring religious freedom to Belarus. While you're standing here now, they are there being persecuted. Some even expect to die. But that number, we pray that that number grows into thousands. And I saw that statue being removed. And when I announced that in the meeting in Minsk, everybody began to shout and the Spirit of God came down. Would you pray with me? I'm not trying to be validated because I've never claimed to be a prophet, and you know that. But would you pray with me that right now, God would stir that whole nation. These, these are young people that want to be free. And the pastors have been timid. Would you pray that the church rise up now, that Christians rise up, and that, that God, God break that stronghold. There are such, it's such a hungry nation, a nation so hungry. And, and I told the people, said, there's going to come a day that we're going to be able, our, our church from Times Square is going to be able to come into Manx, into a stadium, and you're going to see thousands of people saved. Just like it's going to happen down here in, in, in Rosario in Argentina. Would you join me in the balcony, in the annex? Folks, please pray. This is a burden. Father, you're the one who brings down dictators. All over these years and centuries, dictators have risen up and they've mocked you. God, bring down this dictator in Belarus. God, I pray that the crowds grow. Bring thousands into the city square. Bring down that statue of Lenin. But more than that, oh God, bring down this government. Bring freedom, Lord, to Belarus so that the gospel can be freely preached and a revival break out in that country where God's people can be free. Lord, this very hour, I pray in faith with thousands of believers here in Times Square. We care for those around the world. Now, God, I'm asking that even today, people begin to pour. Don't let it stop. It's the beginning of a fire. Let it explode now into a mighty fire that will burn 
and bring down this government. Bring it down, cast it down, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh God, do a miracle. Lord, bring your prophetic word to pass. You said it, I believe it, now settle it. Settle this issue now, settle it, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Now we give you thanks because you hear us when we pray. We give you thanks. Glory be to God.